Good morning. My name is Rabbi Jacob J. Schachter. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the liberation of the concentration camps in Europe. Those American soldiers who fought and sacrificed in an existential battle against fascism were the living embodiment of the ideals of our country, freedom, self-determination, democracy, and justice. The children of the Shoah are now in their 80s and 90s. They're American liberators, including my father, Rabbi Herschel Schachter, Zichrono Livracha of blessed memory, are mostly gone. Yet they forever remain part of the story of the Jewish people, connected through history and through fate. Throughout our history, we have been tasked with a dual responsibility, past and future, to remember and to flourish. 75 years since the worst chapter in modern Jewish history, we commit ourselves to working together with all good and decent human beings everywhere for a world at peace, for an America powerful, peaceful, and protected, for a state of Israel strong and safe and secure, for a Jewish people vibrant, vital, and vigorous. Our tradition teaches us to sanctify the names of those who were murdered, not only by grieving for them, but by dedicating our own lives to the ideals for which they stood. And those who survived the Shoah, the Holocaust, our parents, grandparents, neighbors, and friends, they remain our greatest teachers. We are very honored to have survivors with us here in this room today. Many of you work as docents and volunteers at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum just down the street. I would like to ask all survivors in the room here today to please stand if you are able to do so. Please stand. You, you are our heroes. You are our heroes. Thank you. If you are a descendant of a survivor, please stand. Please stand. The next generation, please stand. Thank you. Thank you. To the American liberators and their proud descendants in this room today, Please stand if you are able. Please stand. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you. And if it's hard for you to stand, thank you so much for your sacrifice and for your service to our country. Thank you so much to all liberators and their families. To all the veterans and active duty U.S. military who continue to serve our country, please stand. Please stand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now I ask all of you to please join those who are standing as we welcome Sergeant Major Bob McDonald and dedicated the singing of our national anthem to those brave Americans who sacrifice and service relit the flame of humanity at a time when the world had gone dark. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave thank you, thank you so much please be seated Much has been written about the days when the Allied troops entered the concentration camps and changed the course of history, saving many from certain death. My late father, Rabbi Herschel Schachter, was among those who liberated the camps. He was a chaplain in the Third Army's Eighth Corps, arriving at the Buchenwald concentration camp shortly after George Patton's troops discovered that place and that area. My father walked through the gates of hell, struggling deeply to understand what he was seeing. When amongst the dead and the dying staring back at him, he saw a child. I was that child. <clears throat> My name is Israel Meir Lau. In Buchenwald, I didn't have a name. I was a number, just a number. My number was 117030. Only later on, I discovered who I am. My father, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lau, let his memory be blessed. He perished in Treblinka. He ordered my brother, Naftali Lau Lavi, former Consul General of Israel to New York, said, if a miracle will happen and we will survive, we have only one place where to go. Eretz Israel was... <clears throat> uh, 
but I have heard the name of my father even in Buchenwald, not only from my brother. The day of liberation, April 11, 45, bullets, bombs from air, from every place, and we were running to the gate, and there was a heap of corpses at the gate, the door was open, the jeeps of the American army of General Patton came in, and one officer with a pistol in his hand went around, he saw a heap of corpses. He was also frightened. He went around and saw a child, he saw me. He understood it's a Jewish child. He took me in his arms and said to me in Yiddish, What's your name? Who are you? And I said, my name, Lulek, is the nickname of Poland, Laud. He said immediately, are you related to the very famous Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lau? I said, I am his son. He was my father. He started to cry. I saw the tears on his cheeks. Rabbi Herschel Shechter, Zichron Olivracha. And then he asked me, how old are you, my child? And I answered, what difference does it make how old I am? I am older than you. He said, why do you think that you are older than me? I was less than eight years old. I said, because you laugh, you smile, and you cry like a child. Many years that I didn't laugh, and I don't cry anymore. So who is older? From Buchenwald, we came to Eretz Israel. In the assistant of the Lord Almighty, I became a rabbi because my father said to my brother, if the miracle will happen and you will survive, remember that your young brother, Lulek, Israel mayor, has to replace me, has to continue the unbroken chain of a rabbinic dynasty. My father was the 37th generation rabbis, and I had to be 38. I made it, and I became the chief rabbi of Netanya, then of Tel Aviv, and then of the whole state of Israel. I cannot share with you all what I do remember, but I will never forget, never forget. And I know our duty to continue the chain to be unbroken. We have to overcome all the problems we have here and in Israel. We have to live together as we knew how to die together to live together in brotherhood, in friendship, we have to do it, it's in our hands. I remember, I remember five weeks after the liberation, the first night of Shavuot, Chag Shavuot, the day that the Torah was given to the people of Israel in the desert. Now, there is a picture, you can see it in Yad Vashem in Yerushalayim. I am also the chairman of the Yad Vashem Council, the largest and the first Holocaust museum and place to teach about the history of the Holocaust. You have there a picture. Look at this picture. Rabbi Herschel Schechter on the left is leading the prayer of Chag Shavuot. You see with the two candles. In the first row, you see a child. I am this child. In the first row, they said from the left. And what do you see here? A combination of two kinds, survivors with the prisoners, and you see here, liberators, Jewish American from the battalion 
who were together with us. We could recite in freedom our prayers together. The word is like Apex says, yesterday, today, tomorrow, also yesterday, together. Don't forget we are one nation, we have one faith, and we live in miracles here and in Israel. Let's strengthen this bridge together and make it Am Israel Chai. The lives of the liberators are forever interwo interwoven and intertwined with the lives of those they saved. Today we gather to remember, to remember not only what was lost, but to pay tribute to all who survived. When Allied forces entered the concentration camps, they discovered more than the broken remnants of the Jewish people. They found the women and the men who still had the strength to help write the next chapter, a new and glorious chapter of a 3,000-year-old story. They and you are in this room today. We are joined in common mission with Americans from all faiths and all backgrounds and all political perspectives, ensuring that our collective voices will never, ever be silenced. That we work together with our elected officials to make America and Israel safe and our world a better place. The descendants of those who survived went on to help build a Jewish nation, steeped in the powerful belief that there is always hope for tomorrow. Towards the end of one of the many services that were held in the camps, those present began to sing an old Jewish song. That song, Hatikva, became the anthem for those who found hope in the depths of hell. Please rise and join your voices with those who sang this song 75 years ago.
Stefan. Please welcome co-CEO of Hashomer Hatzair Life Movement, Naama Moshinsky. My home in Israel is only four and a half hours drive from Damascus. But the first time I ever met a Syrian was on the island of Lesbos in Greece. The island holds more than 8,000 children without a country to call home. Born into lives of desperations, their families have risked everything to escape war, famine, and poverty. As the poet Warsan Shire wrote, no one puts their children in a boat unless the land is safer than the water. When they arrive on the shores of Greece, few are prepared to the hell that awaits them. The camps on Lesbos are supposed to hold 4,000 people. They now hold over 20,000. The wait for permission to resettle somewhere, anywhere more permanent, is long. Many find themselves trapped in limbo. Weeks become months, and months become years. Their reality, every day, is chaos and uncertainty. Their childhood has been robbed from them. But only a few miles from those camps, there's a special place where kids can be kids, where they can learn and grow, where life makes sense again. We call it the International School of Peace. The school began three years ago as a partnership between Jewish and Arab Israeli nonprofits. I am a member of the Hashomer Atzair Life Movement. The, fo the focus of our work, <laughs> thank you. The focus of our work in Israel has always been local and educational. But after watching Syria's civil war drive millions from their homes, we felt a duty to help our neighbors. We joined hands with our partners from Ajiyar and started shipping supplies to the Syrian border to help people fleeing the violence. But we quickly realized that we could have a much bigger impact doing what we do best, educating. All our teachers are refugees. Every day, Syrian, Irani, Afghani, Congolese, and Israeli educators come together to run a school. Our school and the community we've built around it is a living lesson on the value of cooperation, tolerance, and respect. The school succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. Three years into our work, we're going strong as the largest educational program on the island. And we're building a model that can be adopted in other post-disaster refugee areas of the world. To our students, Israel means assistance in dire times. It means unconditional love. It's the sandwich they eat at the beginning of the school day and the hug they get at the end. Earning the trust of our students and their families hasn't always been easy. Many of our students come from countries at war with Israel. Their parents were taught to hate my country. I was taught to fear their countries, too. We've overcome that challenge by making the school the center of a community, by working with the people, not for them. Only when you fully respect the other's identity can you build a future together. We choose to break down the barriers between us and build bridges of hope.
Our dream is that someday soon, all our students will find a home. But until then, we will be there, doing everything we can to give our students a better life and a better future. As Israelis, we carry the legacy of our past within us. Our history gives our actions meaning. We know better than most how to thrive in the face of adversity, how to make a home and hold tight to your identity in dire times. We see our work at the school as our responsibility to future generations. We want to be able to say to those children in Lesbos today, to the next generation of the Israeli society, to the world, we choose differently. We choose to fix what is broken in this world. We choose peace. Thank you. Please welcome Chief Rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of Great Britain and the Commonwealth, Rabbi Ephraim Mervis. Yehuda Avner used to tell the story of David Ben-Gurion, who in 1947 was invited by the British High Commissioner to dinner in his official residence in Jerusalem. During the course of the dinner, Ben-Gurion stood up, he took off his jacket, he perched it on the seat behind him, and he sat down again. The High Commissioner noticed. He took a piece of paper out of his pocket, he scribbled a note, he called a waiter, and the waiter took the note to Ben-Gurion, and he read the message. Dear Mr. Ben-Gurion, please have respect and put your jacket back on. Ben-Gurion flipped the piece of paper around, and he scribbled a note. He called the waiter. The waiter took it over to the High Commissioner, and he read it. Dear High Commissioner, I have permission from your Prime Minister to keep my jacket off. Well, that having been said, the jacket stayed off until the end of the dinner. At the end of the event, when Gurion came over to his host, he thanked him for his hospitality, but the High Commissioner was angry. He said to Ben Gurion, how can you explain the fact that my Prime Minister in London has given you permission here in Jerusalem to keep your jacket off? Yes, said Ben Gurion, it actually happened. You see, he said, earlier this year in January, I was in London for a few weeks. There was a conference in the Middle East. During the course of my stay, I was invited to dinner at 10 Downing Street, during the course of the dinner, I took my jacket off, and the Prime Minister noticed. He took a piece of paper out of his pocket, and he scribbled a note. A waiter brought the note to me, and this is what I read. Mr. Ben-Gurion, when you are in Jerusalem, you can do as you wish. But here in London, I insist, put your jacket back on. Ladies and gentlemen, ever since that time, Prime Ministers of Israel and key Jewish leaders have been warmly and graciously welcomed in 10 Downing Street. But during the last year, we were filled with deep anxiety. What would happen if the next incumbent would be Jeremy Corbyn? What would the consequences be for Jews and Judaism and the State of Israel? And we recognized that the weight of historic responsibility was on our shoulders because a Corbyn victory would send a negative message right around the world. But if Corbyn could be defeated, that would send a positive and encouraging message to Jewish communities and our many friends around the world. On the 12th of December 2019, not only was Labour defeated, it was an emphatic landslide victory. <laughs> Allow me to share with you today three brief lessons from our British experience. The first relates to Jewish unity. When I published my op-ed in The Times, in which I declared that Jeremy Corbyn was unfit to hold high office, a piece that was 
well received by the British public. I did so not in a unilateral man manner, but rather in concert with key Jewish figures and Jewish organizations, because on the matter of anti-Semitism, we have always acted as one. That is why our voice has been heard and our views have been respected. Today, I issue a call to the Jews of America. Please take a leaf out of our book and please speak with one voice. The issue is urgent, it is critical, it is of huge importance to our future. We cannot afford to be divided. What this therefore means is that where there is anti-Semitism, which is prevalent to our left, those who are politically active on the left must see it for what it is and must counter it. And where there is anti-Semitism, which is prevalent on the right, those who are politically active on the right must see it for what it is and they must confront it. There is only one path for us, and that is the bipartisan route. The second lesson. Dalif Nemi Atta Omeid. Know before whom and what you stand. You need to be able to define the problem. If there isn't a clear definition of anti-Semitism, you won't be able to identify who the perpetrators are. Sitting in this hall here today is Lord Eric Pickles, who was responsible for the fact that in December 2016, the British government was the first government in the world to adopt the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. <laughs> Thanks to IHRA, we have clarity on the matter, particularly on the sensitive and important issue surrounding Israel and Zionism as a result. If somebody criticizes a particular policy of a government of Israel, that doesn't mean that that person is necessarily anti-Semitic. But if somebody denies the right of the Jewish people to have their state, that is a different matter. Very often we see that attempts to demonize the state of Israel are none other than attempts to demonize the Jewish people. We need to see it for what it is. We must confront it and we must defeat it. <laughs> and the final lesson. Next week we will be celebrating the festival of Purim. We will recall how Mordechai sent a message to Queen Esther in the palace of King Achashverosh. Umi yodea im la'et kazot who knows, it is probably for this very moment, this time of urgency, that you were given your power and influence. Ladies and gentlemen, that is my message to all of you today. You are in positions of leadership. You have influence. Please use it with all you've got at this time for the sake of Jews and Judaism and Medinat Yisrael. And please use your influence fearlessly and with courage. That is what the Jews of the United Kingdom have done together with our many friends and the results are there to be seen. So consequently, let us act with one voice. Let us do so with a clear vision and let us use our courage and if that is the case, not only can we prevail, we will prevail. God bless you all. Please welcome CEO of the Jazz Leadership Project, Greg Thomas. Thank you. The King David Suite was American jazz legend Lionel Hampton's love letter to Israel. While it was never performed in Washington, D.C., Hampton himself played here dozens of times, including performances for Presidents Eisenhower and Reagan, 
and a birthday duet with President Clinton on sax. Born in Kentucky in 1908, Hamp, or Hampton, uh, he's called Hamp by his friends, he was one of America's jazz greats, having played with the likes of Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald, Art Tatum, Dizzy Gillespie, and Buddy Rich. He rose to musical prominence by playing the vibraphone, the instrument, the musical instrument that would define and shape his career. And he did this while playing with Benny Goodman's Jazz Quartet, the very first integrated jazz group to regularly play in public. In 1940, he formed his own band, the Lionel Hampton Orchestra, which became known worldwide for their energy and showmanship. As the tumultuous 1940s came to a close, Hemp, like many of his contemporaries, took his orchestra abroad where the passion for jazz was thriving. While touring Europe in the spring of 1953, they received the surprise invitation to play in Israel. Now, Hamp was a deeply curious and religious man, so he accepted the invitation, and his lifelong love affair with Israel, its leaders, and its people began. They played more than 40 shows, yes. They played more than 40 shows on that first tour of Israel, performing for more than 170,000 Israelis everywhere, from packed concert halls in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, to kibbutzim in the north and army bases in the Negev. Hampton reveled in the adoration he encountered and the friendships, the friendships he made along the way. But it was his introduction to Israel's chief rabbi, Dr. Isaac Herzog, that had the most profound impact on his Israel experience. Upon meeting Rabbi Herzog, Hamp was eager to talk Judaism, the Bible, and all things Israel. However, kind of a cool cat himself, the rabbi was far more interested in talking about the musical style called Boogie Woogie. <laughs> Herzog told Hamp the story of King David and his harp, marching into the temple with 54 musicians on his tail, playing music and singing to the heavens. It reminded Hamp of the second lines of New Orleans, he was hooked. They visited King David's tomb, King David's tomb in Jerusalem the very next day. In his autobiography, Hampton wrote, I walked into the tomb and looked around for a few minutes, and I was thinking about David and his harp, and a chant just came to me. That chant would become the basis of the King David suite, a beloved piece of music. Hampton's Ode to Israel received rave reviews around the world, cementing the very powerful bond between the American musician and the Jewish state, so much so that he would return to Israel throughout his life, raising money for charities, touring with his band, and hanging out with his friend, David Ben-Gurion. But years later, in 1997, a five-alarm fire swept through the 83-year-old jazz legend's apartment, reducing his instruments, his music, and his life work to ashes. As firefighters battled the blaze, a despondent Hampton could be heard asking, where is my King David suite? Unfortunately, his sheet music was destroyed in the fire. And when he passed away in 2004, he still believed his masterpiece was lost. But in 2008, an original copy of the sheet music was discovered in California. So it was decided that the proper place to archive the music and the notes would be Ben Gurion University of the Negev. In 2019, at a conference at BGU dedicated to Israeli jazz, I was honored to give the keynote address on Hampton's King David Suite and had the pleasure of hearing an arrangement of it 
by tonight's musical guest, or this afternoon's musical guest, Israeli-born trumpeter Itamar Borachov. Those who desire for Israel to flourish give back to her in our own way. For Hampton, it was this beautiful piece of music. For you, it is the work you do to strengthen the bond between America and Israel. And why this room is so important to the movement right now in front of an audience that shares Hamp's passion for Israel in a town that he loved to play in, enjoy a medley from the King David Suite. And marching us into the temple this afternoon, the man himself, Lionel Hampton.
country boy, born in Buckingham County, born on the farm that I still still live on, um, a, the farm that my great-grandfather purchased back in the Great Depression. When I was a, uh, a kid, uh, growing up in a rural area, my father uh, was on the local Farm Bureau uh, uh, board. And so as a kid, my father was good about taking me when he would go lobbying for that, that purpose. And so I'd, I'd had opportunities to be with lobbying groups, but not to really do it on my own. Uh, as APEC has allowed me to do. Prior to APEC, um, my um, appreciation of Israel was two found. Uh, one is I'm a Christian, and I believe part of the, my calling as a Christian is to support Israel. The second was just a very practical um, um, reason for security um, for this for my country. APEC is probably the really only organization right now where you're going to have a, a policy conference once a year where you have both Republicans and Democrats sitting together. It's, it's a great opportunity to learn more, and then it's also a great opportunity to take that knowledge and and hopefully um, share that knowledge with those who are in a position to make changes. This is the house where I was brought up. I'm one of six. This was really a house of happiness and goodness to others. My father is Dr. David Applebaum, and he was a superman in the most real way. As a physician and a world-known emergency doctor, he connected to each and every person he, he spoke to. My father's work was really part of, part of our family and part of our home. It was important for him that you, know, you don't just treat the illness, you actually treat the patient. Patients would come in in the middle of a Shabbat meal, and my father would either take care of them uh, on the couch, right next to us all, or in the kitchen, that I remember him suturing right here. It was just a part of us. My father had a lot of experience with terror attacks here in Israel. He would either go straight to the attack or to the hospital. He had this urge in him to help to, to save lives everywhere and any time he could. In 2003, I was 14, and we were preparing for my sister Nava's wedding. My father and Nava went out to pick up some iced coffee from Café Lil. It was my father's time with Nava, just them alone, to have a chat and to get her ready in his, in his way for her wedding. We're familiar with, um, with those sounds growing up in, in Jerusalem. To hear the explosion, and then there's a minute of silence, and then sirens. We got a phone call from a friend telling us there was an attack in Café Lel. Our friend brought us to the hospital, and as we walked in, my older brother, Natan, was, um, was waiting for us. And he told us my father was killed. And then, maybe an hour or two later, they told us Nava was killed. I was shocked. I mean, it, it just, it couldn't be because my father was always on the other side, and he was strong, and he would be the one saving lives. And um, Nava was um, Nava was just hours from her wedding. She was so happy. After such a great loss, you have a choice. My family, we chose life. We took all of what we got and all the inspiration from my father and from Nava, and we tried to live life like, just like they did. Hello. Hello.
Most of us did end up in the medical field. We have Natan, my brother, who's, um, who's running the clinic and carrying on after my father. And then we have my sister and my boss, Shira, who's a paramedic and head of the nursing staff. And then there's me, working as a nurse. We all work together, we have a good time, and I'm sure my father is thrilled. I love what I do. Every day when I walk into work, I pass my father's uh, picture. I mean, I, I feel like he's with me. He's with me all day. Today, I'm a mom of four. My David is named after my father, and he was actually born on the anniversary of, of the attack. A few years later, I had a girl, and we named her Nava, Rachel, after my sister Nava. Life here is so hard. It's a combination of loss and grief together with life and grace and that's what makes us who we are. Please welcome Shana Applebaum Abramson and Shira Applebaum Moreski. On behalf of our family, we are proud to honor the legacy of our father and sister. There are too many families like ours who have lost loved ones to terrorism. Every day, we work to carry on the values we were taught to treat everyone with care and respect. Thank you for your support for Israel and your belief in the power of resilience and life. Thank, Thank you. you. Please welcome Senior Research Scientist for the United States Department of Veterans Affairs, Dr. Ann Spungen. Good morning. It's wonderful to be with all of you, the leaders of APAC. Ten years ago, I met a fellow scientist from Israel, and his ingenuity changed the lives of hundreds of people here in the United States and around the globe. I know him as my friend Amit. You know him as the now famous, you know him as the inventor of the now famous Rewalk. Rewalk allows those, thank you. Rewalk allows those with paraplegia to stand and walk again an achievement that was once unimaginable. People all over the world, including American veterans, are defying the odds and standing tall thanks to Amit. In more recent years, Amit has remained busy, finding a way to help thousands of wheelchair users to have greater mobility and a better life, including those with spinal cord injury, stroke, ALS, and multiple sclerosis. The United States Veterans Health Administration and the Department of Defense understand the importance these innovations have for our veterans. I am proud to say they have generously supported research to study these devices more closely. This partnership is one of the best examples of U.S.-Israel cooperation leading to life-changing solutions. <laughs> to put Amit's story in a bit more context, let's go back to the 2013 APAC Policy Conference when we first met Amit and one of the people who was able to benefit from using the rewalk. 
I was hunting with one of my good friends and I fell about 12 feet right on my back and I knew instantly that I was paralyzed. I heard about this exoskeleton invented by an Israeli engineer that he wanted to create a device for people with spinal cord injuries to get up and walk. Rewalk allows me to feel normal again, to walk from point A to point B. Please welcome Dan Webb. The first time I actually used the rewalk, I told myself I wanted to meet the man responsible for helping me get back on my feet. This morning, you and I get to meet him together. Though the rewalk can't work for me at present, uh, since I am a quadriplegic and the uh, device is for uh, paraplegic, we are working on that and soon I'll be able to stand next to Dan and each, each of you. My friends, soon is today. Please give me a warm welcome to Dr. Amit Glaffer. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anne, for your partnership, which allows us to help so many people in the world. And I am uh, proud to have you as my friend. <laughs> um, the Up and Ride is now FDA approved, which means people will be able to use it here in America. Thank you. Uh, since the time I was on this stage, and because of my newest uh, development, I have been able to stand. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, stand under the hoopa uh, next to my youngest child as she took her wedding vows. <laughs> uh, please know that your help, your work, helped America and Israel uh, bring innovative solutions to our world. Thank you, APAC. Please welcome United States Marine Corps veteran, Mia Garcia. Thank you. American veterans know the value of bipartisanship. We don't concern ourselves with party affiliation because our common mission is what matters most. We serve side by side to protect and defend our country. And American veterans know the value of a strong ally and dependable friend. Just take a look. I'm the daughter of two proud Army veterans and the granddaughter of a World War II Navy veteran. And I joined the Air Force right after college. A lot of my heroes had started in the military. It kind of harkens back to that sort of JFK ideal of 
of doing something for your country. I wanted to give back and I wanted to, uh, to be a part of, of something bigger than myself. You know, it was a tremendous opportunity. I think veterans immediately bring some credibility when it comes to talking about the national security challenges and the threats that Israel faces. We get it. American service members and veterans and Israel service members share the, the common bond. Uh, I would call it the warrior ethos, a commitment to service, service to country, service to your community, service to your family, service to your God. We hold a lot of common values, and that's not something you can say as you look around the region. Our success in the United States military has been a result of our investments in our people and our resources. And part of that investment is working with alliances. Israel is coming up with some of the most advanced technology that not only supports the U.S. to keep us safe and secure, but there's a lot of best practices shared. We've invested technology and dollars in the Iron Dome for the state of Israel, but now we're actually seeing the, the value of that here in the United States. What Israel does for their national defense translates directly over into technology, to strategy, and to tactical advances for the U.S. military and our security and our strength for the future. As military folks, we know how important it is to continue to support Israel while they can support themselves and take care of themselves. We would be amiss if we did not continue to be the biggest supporter. My promise to APAC is to not become complacent, but educate people about Israel and take a stand on a local level however I can. For fellow veterans, I think that it's just a tremendous opportunity to be involved in something. You may have taken off the uniform for the last time, but to be involved with an ally like Israel and helping further that relationship, I think is tremendously rewarding. It's something that you can't help but absolutely be engaged in and to be an activist for. And this has been a wonderful conduit to continue that activism. Please welcome the United States Secretary of State, Michael Pompeo. Good evening, everyone. What a, what a crowd. What a crowd. It's great to be here. It is wonderful to be with you all tonight. I, I want to say a few thank yous. Uh, my thanks to uh, APAC Board Chairman Mort Fridman, my friend Howard Corr and your new president, uh, Betsy Burns-Corn, and all the incredible APAC members and amazing volunteers for putting this amazing gathering together. Thank you. God bless you all. I've, uh, I, I've been here a few times. When I was a member of Congress, I got to know the APAC team. They were relentless. I came to love them. Uh, uh, but it is wonderful, and it never gets old to be here with so many great friends of the relationship between America and Israel. You should, you should know that there's, uh, there's no president and no administration that loves Israel more than President Trump and our team. So I, I was gonna, I was gonna walk through the things we've done in three years, but I'm just gonna do since I was here last time because we gotta, we all gotta get someplace tonight. <laughs> so let's take a look at what I've done just since the last time I stood right here. Uh, we declared the common sense truth that the Israeli West Bank settlements aren't per se inconsistent with international law. We, we released a groundbreaking vision for peace. And President Trump took out one of the world's worst anti-Semites, the terrorist Qasem Soleimani. Thank you. 
So the, the previous administration had a phrase that used to say, it used to say that Osama bin Laden is dead and General Motors is alive. So that was good. Um, I think we could do one better. Qasem Soleimani is dead and Israel and the United States are alive. What's, what's really important about that is that nations of the Middle East and the world are recognizing just how enduring Israel is. They're coming to recognize that the more the Middle East embraces Israel, the brighter their future will be. And that's, and that's what I want to focus on this evening. Under President Trump, Israel is not a pariah, but a partner, and rightly so. Our special nations, our special nations show so much, a pioneering spirit, basic rights and freedoms, including religious freedom and pluralism, rough and tumble politics. Indeed, Israel loves democracy so much, today's, they're holding their third election. They just can't get enough of them. Uh, and just think of all the benefits that Israel brings to the region in which it lives. It's an example of pluralism and free speech. It is a... Israel brings a robust, free market, innovative economy where entrepreneurship is rewarded. And it is a place, it is a unique place in that region, a place where all can worship freely without fear or favor. These good things have ripple effects. You all, you all know this. A strong democracy sets that example for pluralism. A productive Israeli economy creates jobs. And, Israeli, and an Israeli society respectful of all faiths shows there's nothing to fear from religious minorities. Now, not every nation or institution is as supportive of a strong, free, democratic, and prosperous Israel as we are. But look closely, look closely around the world, and you will see that the nations of the world are increasingly embracing Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people as central to a bright future for the Middle East. In December, in December, Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced plans for his government to pass an anti-BDS law. That same month, French parliamentarians voted to declare anti-Zionism as anti-Semitism, as I spoke about last year. Greece and Cyprus have pursued a new energy partnership with Israel, as have Egypt and Jordan. Guatemala, Honduras, Nauru have recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and Brazil says that it intends to do so. Come join. Look to at the budding trend in the Middle East. Israel's Gulf nations are, nations are warming to her. In 2018, Oman received Prime Minister Netanyahu for a visit. That very same year, the UAE played the Israeli national anthem, the Hope, at a judo tournament hosted in Abu Dhabi, not once, but twice. Last year, our Bahraini friends allowed Israeli journalists to visit for the first time since 1994. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman said, quote, I believe, I believe the Palestinians, the Israelis have the right to have their own land. And I remember being in that room when ambassadors from Oman, Bahrain, and the UAE attended the White House ceremony unveiling the vision for peace, where President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu both offered remarks. Now, these are just small examples, just a few glimpses of harmony, and there's still much more progress to be made. But I think these anecdotes suggest a growing attitude, a real shift, a shift among some of Israel's neighbors. And the more the Middle East embraces Israel, the brighter its future will be. That's true for the entire region. You know, as I said earlier, there, there are some around the world who still refuse to see Israel's shining example or respect Israel's rights as a nation. 
The number one state sponsor of anti-Semitism in the world, the Islamic Republic of Iran, is undoubtedly the worst. The regime continues to stoke hatred of Jews to serve their own corrupt ends. Through classroom textbooks, state media propaganda, and the poison declarations of their unelected leaders. You know, how, how sad, given that Iranians gave sanctuary to Jews during the Holocaust and helped Jewish families escape persecution in Iraq. It doesn't have to be this way. Let me be clear. The world knows, the world knows that the noble Iranian people do not hate Israel or Jews or any other religious group. It's the bigoted, intolerant regime that does. And it is, and it is that regime, it is that regime and its views as the reason that President Trump said so clearly that Iran will never obtain a nuclear weapon while we're on watch. So who else refuses to respect Israel? Sadly, there are members of Congress who do too. In November, I received a letter from 106 members of Congress. They criticized moving the embassy to Jerusalem, closing the Palestinian office in DC, halting foreign assistance to the West Bank and Gaza, and the rethinking that we did at the State Department about the settlements issue. Their claim, their claim in this letter was that this discredited the United States as an honest broker between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. They claim this has severely damaged prospects for peace. They claim that this endangered the security of America, Israel, and the Palestinian people. You know, that discredits the United States. What, what damages peace, what endangers security? It's not recognizing the truth. The truth must be spoken, and it's what President Trump and our administration has done. The harm, the, the harm, look, the, the, harm, the harm to Israel, the harm to the region, the harm to the relationship between the United States and Israel comes from denying that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. By denying the closing of the Palestinian in Washington was 100% necessary following President Abbas's 2017 remarks at the UN. What, what damages and discredits the United States and our relationship with Israel is denying that Palestinian terrorism has been the real obstacle to peace. And it, and it discredits this relationship when you deny that the settlement issue is a political dispute and not a political puzzle. As, and I'll have more to say about that in just a moment. And finally, the UN. The UN's so-called Human Rights Council and the High Commissioner Michelle Bachelet. You know, for those of you who are watching, the Council recently released a database of companies doing business in East Jerusalem and Israeli settlements in the West Bank. That release from the United Nations only serves to facilitate the BDS movement and delegitimize Israel. How sad. I remember reading it after its release. This is an organization that was set to, up to ensure that no people ever again faced horrors like the Jews faced during the Holocaust, and it is now anti-Semitic. <laughs> this administration was right when President Trump asked us to leave an international institution that grossly betrays its most fundamental mandate. <laughs> My friends, my friends, President Trump's team aren't standing for this nonsense. We know that the more the Middle East embraces Israel, the brighter the future will be. It's why we've taken action against those who would harm or weaken Israel. We've, we've enacted the strongest pressure campaign in history to deprive the Islamic Republic of Iran diplomatic sanctuary or money for terror. We, we rallied nations in our own hemisphere, here in the Western Hemisphere and in Europe, to declare Hezbollah a terrorist organization in its entirety. And we've had other nations now join us in uh, banning Mahan Air that has flown around dangerous military actors, the Ayatollah's airline of choice, so that it can't move around weapons and fighters in the region that put Israelis at risk.
On the settlements issue, on the settlements, we couldn't be more clear. We've concluded that the Obama administration's wrong approach did not help the peace process or prospects for peace. We worked, we got it right, we disavowed the Hansel Memo of the 1970s, which declared that civilian settlements beyond the Green Line were illegal, just as President Ronald Reagan had rejected that memo a few years after it was written. And let me remind you that no less than Senator Schumer said right here at APAC in 2018 that it's sure not the settlements that are the blockage to peace. And further on the settlements issue, I know some American companies are wondering, some of you here today are wondering uh, how to move forward in the wake of the UN Human Rights Council's release of the database that I just spoke about. It, it may not seem like much to some of you, but this is a real threat. And I'm proud to tell you that this afternoon, the State Department released official guidance on this subject. Here's what we said. We said that we share your frustration. We will continue to work with trade and invest in Israel. Neither the Human Rights Council nor the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights has the power to tell you what you can and can't do business in the West Bank. Don't be intimidated if you're being subjected to imitation or harassment because of this database. Let America know and the United States will respond to take actions against members of our business community that are being threatened by this release that was so sorely mistaken. It's consistent with all that we have done. We will stand for a strong, free, democratic, and prosperous Middle East and a prosperous Israel at the heart of that Middle East. The more the Middle East embraces Israel, the brighter the future will be. It's really quite simple. We stand with Israel. We stand for peace in the Holy Land. We stand with the great Israeli people. And we stand for the unbreakable bond between our two great nations rooted rooted in our shared traditions of freedom and equality. That tradition goes back to a beautiful biblical teaching that all humans are created, Betze Elohim, in the image of God. <clears throat> that matters for it drives all that we do together. And I know that's what everyone here in attendance tonight believe. I know that it's what the members of APAC believe. It's what we all believe in. May God bless this great institution of APAC. May God bless Israel. And God bless these great United States of America. Thank you all. involved in APAC probably in the early 80s and attended my first policy conference. I don't know if it was called policy conference at the time um, when I was in college. It was insightful. It was a wonderful learning experience and I was hooked. So fast forward, I had kids. Um, when they were in high school, we got back involved as a family and it's really special that we can activate as a family. APAC is a family business for all of us. And we know that what we do is not just for today or for tomorrow. As a parent, I look at my kids and I know that their future is really contingent upon our mission and our movement today. I understand that my asks, my commitments, my return to Washington will be until I'm no, no longer able to walk and then my children will carry the torch. We're gonna keep coming back. We're gonna come back tomorrow, we're gonna come back next year and the year after. This is a long-term game. We wanna know that Israel will be safe and secure and the partnership with the United States will be preserved for centuries to come. Please welcome APAC Director of Legislative Strategy, Policy and Government Affairs, Esther Kurtz.
afternoon. As we know, it's getting harder and harder to get legislators to come together on issues uh, in a bipartisan way and leaders to come together. And yet, we have with us today a leader who uh, has done so throughout her career. Uh, she has been willing to reach across the aisle to cultivate strong partnerships and actually get things done. So I am honored to introduce today one of our true champions who has made the U.S.-Israel relationship and bipartisanship a top priority for her work in Congress for decades. As a result of her leadership, Congress has passed bills to make Israel and the U.S.-Israel relationship stronger. As a result of her commitment, America's support for Israel's safety and security has never come into question. Please join me in welcoming to the policy conference stage chairwoman of the House Appropriations Committee and an amazing pro-Israel friend and leader, Congresswoman Nita Lowy. Welcome, Congresswoman Lowy. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, as you know so well, it's getting harder and harder to get leaders from the opposite party <clears throat> to work together to actually get things done. And yet, you have this amazing relationship with your counterpart, your Republican counterpart, Kay Granger, on the Appropriations Committee. Uh, <laughs> um, and you're able to pass all 12 appropriations bills, at least in the House, and pass amazing pro-Israel legislation. Can you talk to us a little bit about what's the secret of your ability to work together? Well, and first of all, this is my 32nd APAC meeting. <laughs> and I just must tell you, since, as you know, I'm retiring at the end of the year, uh, it has been for me such an honor and privilege to work with you. When you come into the office, you know the facts, you know the whole story. I don't have to tell you anything, I just listen. So let's applaud all the members of APAC. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for your advocacy. Now, the question was about bipartisanship. And I have been very clear that APAC must remain strongly bipartisan. We have to know the facts as you do. And as members of Congress, we welcome you to our office, whether you're from the left, the right, or the center because you understand the importance of the Israel-United States relationship. Now, I have been a strong Democrat, but I have always worked closely with my Republican either co- You know, sometimes I'm chair, sometimes I'm ranking, depending who's in charge around here. But what's important and is essential that you can tell us a thing or two because you have the facts. And I look forward to APAC always, re always remaining bipartisan. It is key to your success. And again, you're a great example of that in terms of, of, of your working relationship with, with Congresswoman Granger and others. Let's get to a topic, a favorite topic of ours is, is aid to Israel. You have been a consistent supporter of aid um, and uh, overall foreign aid bill and aid to Israel in, in particular. Yet we've seen there are several presidential candidates that have talked about cutting aid or leveraging aid in order to get Israel to change its policies on some issues. You've opposed those efforts in the past. Can you talk to us a little bit about why they're so damaging? Absolutely. And first of all, I don't have to tell anyone in this room the importance of your vote. And if anyone out there is suggesting that we cut aid to Israel, it comes from their ignorance, frankly, and they don't understand 
the importance of the Israel-United States relationship. And I know that when you come to the office, you have the facts, and it's up to you to keep coming. I understand there are more than 10,000 this year. Oh, 18,000. 18,000. I applaud all of you. And I don't want to underestimate the importance of your coming here, you're getting the information, and most of all, you're giving the information. Because not every member of Congress grew up in the Bronx, New York, was a member of the, <laughs> was a member of the Young Israel Concourse, had a mother who was committed from the, oh, since I was a little girl, I understood the importance of the Israel-United States relationship, but you can't assume that everyone understands the importance. And by the way, when we are voting for aid, a lot of that money comes right back spent in the United States of America. And you know that, and I know that, but not everyone knows that. So the facts are absolutely critical. It's also important to have key leaders like yourself in charge of the process, and thank well, you for your support. you know, it's been difficult for me because when I was elected head of the Appropriations Committee, I was in charge. I could have chosen a bill that is now up to about $150 billion, and very important to me, labor, HHS, a lot of good things that matter to all of us, or the foreign aid appropriations bill that has about 52 billion. We try and stretch it, Esther, <laughs> as much as we can, but there was no question that I had the opportunity to be chair of the whole committee, and there was no question that I wanted to retain the chairmanship of the committee that keeps Israel secure and keeps strengthening the U.S.-Israel relationship. And we're very lucky you did. Thank you. Um, so you're about to conclude over 30 years in Congress. And in that time period, you've seen a lot of changes. You've seen a lot of challenges. Talk to us a little bit in terms of the U.S.-Israel relationship. What have been, what's been the most satisfying moment in those 30 years? And what's been the most difficult one? Well, that's, that's very tough because I know, and most of my colleagues understand, how important the relationship is, not just to Israel, but to the United States of America and how important it is in that region of the world. Now, I was just in Israel to commemorate the loss of millions, billions of people. And we went to Auschwitz first and had a commemoration there. You never can take anything for granted. No one can predict the future. So for me and for my colleagues and for everyone in this audience, we have to make sure that the Israel-United States relationship remains strong. This partnership is key. And whenever I go to Israel, I was just there. I make sure I continue to talk about the strength of the Israel-United States relationship, both to Israel and to the United States of America. And I've been a strong supporter even before I got to Congress, and I will remain an important supporter after I leave Congress. So before we conclude, as you have mentioned, um, this will be your last year in Congress. And Nita, ever since you came, first came to Congress in 1989, I have had the privilege of watching your meteoric rise within the ranks of the Democratic leadership and watched you take leading roles on so many vital issues. But the issue of the U.S.-Israel relationship has always had a special place in your heart. 
you have never been afraid to stand up in vocal support of that relationship, whether publicly challenging the then chairman of the Foreign Ops Subcommittee, you remember that? That was quite a moment. I don't want to share that with you. <laughs> it was one of those moments I will never forget, but you stood up there when he challenged aid to Israel and successfully took him on, which was a great moment. Or presidents, whether they be Republican or Democrat, who have gone astray. You leave behind an enormous legacy of vital pro-Israel legislation and also relationships with key members of Congress who learned from you the value of close U.S.-Israel ties. It's no exaggeration to say that the U.S.-Israel alliance would not be nearly as strong as it is today were it not for the incredible work you put into it all these years. In that, you follow in the great tradition of the many Jewish women throughout our history who have really made a difference for the Jewish people, and you have. Every person in this room owes you an enormous debt of gratitude. You will be sorely missed. So, ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in expressing our profound appreciation and thanks to Congresswoman Nita Lowy for all her contribution to the U.S.-Israel relationship. Welcome, United States Ambassador to Israel, David M. Friedman. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before I start, how about one more round of applause for our great, great Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. Thank you again. It's so great to be back here on this big stage now for my third time. Thank you, APAC, for giving me this opportunity. We can we came into office in early 2017 on the heels of a great betrayal of Israel by the United States. The failure of the United States to vote against or to veto United Nations Security Council Resolution 2334. It was a resolution so virulently hostile to the state of Israel that it literally deemed the Western Wall to be illegally occupied territory. We also inherited the JCPOA, an agreement in which the last administration released more than $100 billion to the Islamic Republic of Iran, the world's most lethal state sponsor of terrorism, and gave it a pathway to a nuclear weapon. Iran used those funds to enhance its arsenal of ballistic missiles, and expanded its malign activity throughout Yemen, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, all the while shouting death to Israel and death to America. Incredibly, none of that disgraceful activity was even prohibited under the JCPOA. We didn't enter office on the 50-yard line of the U.S.-Israel relationship. No. We found ourselves deep within our own territory and playing against the wind. And so from that vantage point, we set out to work. You all know what happened next. President Trump fulfilled his campaign pledge, the same pledge made but ignored by his predecessors, and moved the United States Embassy to Israel's undivided and eternal capital. 
the city of Jerusalem, where it must always remain. President Trump understood the security imperative of Israel's permanent retention of the Golan Heights, and he recognized Israel's sovereignty over that strategic high ground. And in a rebuke to our predecessor's shameful endorsement of Resolution 2334, this past year, President Trump and Secretary Pompeo reversed 40 years of flawed legal analysis and concluded that Israeli settlements in Judea and Samaria do not violate international law. I'd like to put a bit of a finer point on this last issue. When Secretary Pompeo issued his opinion on settlements, Hysteria overcame the progressive left. One by one, I heard and I read of the so-called recklessness of this legal conclusion. Everyone knows, everyone knows, they said, that settlements are illegal. My friends, this just tells us how far the goalposts moved against Israel during the last administration. The United States position on settlements was first developed in the immediate aftermath of the Six-Day War. Our chief diplomat on this issue was the former Under Secretary of State Eugene Rostow, who left his position as the Dean of the Yale Law School to serve our country in negotiating United Nations Security Council Resolution 242, the universally acknowledged foundation for the resolution of the conflict. Dean Rostow, the unparalleled expert and the primary fact witness on the subject of the legality of West Bank settlements, stated that Israel's rights to build them was, in his words, not my words, but his words, unassailable. He was right then, and President Trump and Secretary Pompeo are right now. On the security front, President Trump exited the JCPOA, imposing, <laughs> imposing crippling sanctions on Iran, and he killed the world's most dangerous terrorist, Qasem Soleimani. <laughs> Iran is still an enemy of the United States and Israel, but it is a far weaker one, and there is no doubt that we will prevail in this critical conflict. So having reached midfield, to return to our football analogy, with regard to the U.S.-Israel relationship, we embraced the diplomatic challenge of trying to advance a peaceful resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. On January 28th of this year, President Trump unveiled his vision for peace, prosperity, and a brighter future. We're very proud of this vision. I think it represents a realistic, viable, and achievable two-state solution that protects Israel's security and gives the Palestinians a pathway to independence, greater dignity, and statehood. Those who accuse this plan of being too pro-Israel just haven't read it carefully enough. Sure, it is pro-Israel on the issue of security. Security is not a game, and it's not political. Security in this part of the world is life and death. We will never compromise Israel's security. And in keeping this pledge, we are also ensuring the security of the Palestinians as well. By the way, you've probably heard every political figure from both sides of the aisle promised you, just as I just did, that they will never 
compromise Israel's security. It gets a big applause line. I understand why they do it. But when you hear that, when you hear those words, don't be so quick to applaud. The devil is in the details. You should ensure, you should ensure that they will not return to the disastrous Iran deal. And you should make sure that they will not impose upon Israel their view as to how Israel should defend itself. If you get the wrong answers to these questions, I would suggest you run, don't walk, from these so-called friends. The Trump administration demonstrates not just in words but in deeds and in unprecedented detail just how committed we are to Israel's security. And sure, our plan is pro-Israel on keeping Jerusalem as Israel's undivided capital. That's been American law since the Jerusalem Embassy Act passed overwhelmingly in 1995. Anyone who speaks of returning the embassy to Tel Aviv is rejecting a generation of overwhelming bipartisan consensus. <laughs> Jerusalem has been accessible to all major faiths only, only since 1967 under Israeli control. And I'll tell you something you may already know. The last thing the Arabs of East Jerusalem want is to be transferred to a separated Palestinian state. Indeed, we just witnessed the Arab communities in Israel's Northern Triangle protest vehemently about the prospect of being part of a Palestinian state. And to its credit, the state of Israel said the same thing. It wants to keep the Arab minority intact. As in every democratic country, there are issues in Israel with the absorption and assimilation of minority populations, especially those who do not accept Israel's right to exist or serve in its defense forces. But compare how Israel treats its Arab minority with the rights of minorities in other surrounding nations and lots of other nations worldwide. Frankly, Israel has a lot to be proud of. The far left won't say this, but the truth is that the vision of President Trump offers a tremendous opportunity to the Palestinian people. It represents the first time since the beginning of the conflict that the state of Israel has agreed to live side by side a Palestinian state under precise terms, conditions, and territorial dimensions. It allocates the territory in Judea and Samaria in proportion to the respective sizes of the Israeli and Palestinian populations who live there. It creates a platform for massive investment, not the handouts that the Palestinian leadership has embraced for so long with nothing to show for it other than the personal enrichment of the leaders themselves. And it provides a four-year runway for the Palestinians to achieve the necessary conditions of statehood securing the knowledge that during that period the territorial integrity of their potential state will be preserved. When you, stu when you students on college campuses, where are you guys? Where, where, can, where are the students? All right, come see me next year, I'll get you better seats, all right? When you students on college campuses hear Israel castigated as a nation intent on subjugating its oppressed minority, this plan, which has been overwhelmingly endorsed by the Israeli population, conclusively proves just the opposite. Now, some have challenged the president's vision as leaving too much land to Israel. Imagine that. They demand that the Jewish state should surrender places like Hebron, the burial place of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah, or Beit El, where Jacob dreamed of a ladder with angels ascending to the heavens and descending back to earth and where he received the word of God. 
Shiloh, where the Ark of the Covenant rested for hundreds of years before being moved to the temple in Jerusalem. Or Kasser al Yehud, the castle of the Jews, where Joshua led the Israelite nation across the, across the Jordan River and where John the Baptist baptized Jesus. We are all familiar with the ugly term Judenrein. It was a term used by the Nazis for a place where Jews were not allowed. Well, let me make something abundantly clear. Under the Trump administration, the biblical heartland of Israel in Judea and Samaria will never be Judenrein. Now, we've been accused of sponsoring a wedding without a bride. We were fully aware of the initial certainty of Palestinian rejection. That strategy has been their standard operating procedure since the days of Camp David and Arafat. But I trust you have listened carefully to all the reactions on the world stage. In many respects, they have been unprecedented and incredibly positive. Two weeks ago, President Abbas went to his favorite move within his playbook and sought condemnation of President Trump's vision by the United Nations Security Council. He went in expecting a 14 to 1 vote with the U.S. veto. He was confident that he could isolate the United States and Israel from the West, rest of the world. But thanks to the diplomatic efforts of Jared Kushner and Avi Berkowitz and Ambassador Kelly Graft, President Abbas could not even muster a majority of votes. He pulled the resolution and returned home empty-handed. The world is changing. The world has grown tired, perhaps even exhausted of the failed Palestinian leadership, the violence, the corruption, the payment of terrorists, the incitement of hatred, and the breathtaking disrespect for their own people's human rights and basic freedoms. The Palestinian people deserve so much better, and we will continue to make the case wherever and whenever people of good faith are willing to listen for the Palestinians to engage on this plan. <laughs> to all of us in the pro-Israel community, we need to speak in one voice on this. We need to speak in a voice that demonstrates that this is a realistic plan, worthy of serious consideration and negotiation. We do no service to Israel or the Palestinians by criticizing the plan without giving it a fair reading as I have heard from so many across the aisle. Just to give you a sense of how disturbing this has become, we have been accused by purportedly serious people who claim to love Israel of creating a vision that establishes a Palestinian Bantustan. Does any of you know what a Bantustan is? It was created in the 1950s by the racist regime in South Africa which forcefully evacuated its black population from within, from within racially mixed communities, literally pulled them from their homes and drove them into racially segregated slums with virtually no infrastructure or municipal services. How dare anyone refer to our plan as having that purpose or effect? Not a single Palestinian is being forced or even asked to leave his or her home. Not only are Palestinians not being confined with an overcrowded or underserved territory, but the geographic footprint is more than doubling. They are slated for a multi-billion dollar infusion of investment capital, and they have a pathway to statehood if they can abandon their self-destructive practices. I've wanted... I've wanted to say this for some time to my friends on the left. Hating Donald Trump is not an Israel policy. <laughs> it 
If the only reason you don't like our policy in Israel is that you don't like our president, then regrettably, we will remain unnecessarily and needlessly divided and potentially miss a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. <laughs> History will not be kind. Had President Obama, with whom I had profound disagreements, had he moved our embassy to Jerusalem, had he recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, had he restored tough sanctions on Iran and authored President Trump's vision for peace, I would have been the first to applaud and I'd still be applauding today. Of course, none of these things were accomplished by President Obama. In fact, they were all achieved by President Donald J. Trump. And for that, we should all be the first to applaud and still be applauding today. I am prepared to fight for the soul of our nation and how it supports Israel. I think this is a fight that is as important for America as it is for Israel. Our Judeo-Christian values are at stake. So many of our close relatives died because they were Jews or because they were Zionists. Our task, thank God, is not to die as Jews or Zionists, but rather to live as Jews and to live as Zionists and, of course, to live as patriotic Americans. Not to define ourselves as perennial victims, but rather to seize the miraculous opportunity given us to anchor the U.S.-Israel relationship for our children, our grandchildren, and generations beyond. It is a challenge that together we can meet and we must meet. We all want peace. We will not bring peace by failing to hold the Palestinians accountable for malign activity that makes peace impossible. We will not bring peace by indulging Palestinian rejectionism at the UN or elsewhere. We will not bring peace by applying standards to Israel that no other nation facing the same risks would ever observe. That's not the path to peace. So please, to all of you who love Israel, work with us to help bring a real peace to this region that has suffered for so long. We can and should unite on the President's vision, encourage our elected officials to endorse it, and do all we can to induce the Palestinians to come to the table. Let's do this together, regardless of our political stripes, our religious practices, or our ideological leanings. This is above all that. The founding document of our republic, the Declaration of Independence, declared all people to be endowed by their creator with unalienable rights. How did our founders know which rights God deemed to be unalienable? By reading the Bible, of course. And from where did these biblical pronouncements come? In the words of Isaiah, out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This is our legacy, and this is our destiny. This is who we are as Americans, and this is who we always must be, proud, patriotic, and always standing with our greatest ally, the State of Israel. Please repeat with me. Am Yisrael Chai. Thank you. May God bless you. May God bless Israel. May God bless the United States of America.
we would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.